It is impossible to fully describe what I saw that morning. As the sun rose over the horizon, beckoning the day forth, and the volcano behind us rumbled its unhappy tune, the ashen rock beneath us seemed to tremble in anticipation of the coming mob of evil. Imagine water poured from a vase. That is what I beheld in the molten valley. A great tide of churning green monsters slithering and pouring their way into the open field, preparing to slaughter everything in their wake. I stood beside Night Warden Knight William and Tomaway, all watching it, taking in the sight. We had our plan, for it though it was. It was what we had worked with. Tomaway and myself would engage the enemy directly, buying William and a small squad of allies to flank the enemy. Find the war chief and in him to sow chaos through the ranks of the orcs. And pray, pray that the Sisters of Lupin could hold off the orc reinforcements long enough for us to accomplish this task. You'd better get moving, I warned. Time is not on our side. Gather your soldiers and get on your own mission, Matt Warden. I'll wait until the battle begins, William said coldly. If I leave too soon and the orcs notice, the element of surprise will be lost. Not necessarily. Orcs are single-minded creatures and likely wouldn't have noticed or cared if a handful of soldiers pulled away from the front lines, as they'd be too busy trying to reach the battle in front of them in any case. But William was thinking tactically and was not as familiar with orc psychology as the average guardsman, so he could be forgiven for this oversight. They draw closer, Tomway warned. And it was true. The monsters were seething forth, their roaring and incessant screaming for bloodshed, was becoming quite deafening. William stepped forward and raised his right hand into the sky. The weight of his gesture was palpable. The sensation was suffocating. And then, with a single command, hell was unleashed. Fire! he roared, bringing his hand down. On his command, fifteen catapults unleashed their payload in one furious hail of debris. The flaming chunks of rock and wood rained on the orcs, crushing several, setting others ablaze, and tripping up their momentum. The catapults continued to fire, raining in no uncertain rhythm upon the green prey, in an attempt to slow their approach. And at first it seemed to have an effect. The beasts were shocked by the attack, some turning to look back at what had happened and why they smelled the burning flesh of their own comrades. But then battle lust returned within moments, and the mass of green was now moving again now only five hundred yards away from our main force. The time had come. I raised my spear into the sky and pointed forward. Valhalla stands before you, Valkenheim! Ride now to ruin, to death, to glory, and to Odin's Hall, for Valkenheim and for Reynald! The roar of the Vikings was just as furious as the orcs, and I watched as the front line of our army ran out to meet the enemy. In the front of the attack were raiders, and, bless me, I still could not believe it, a mass of Highlanders. I had seen raiders fight before, their fury was nothing short of legendary, but Highlanders. I'd only seen a handful of them since I was a child, and even then never in battle. But here I watched giant men, with swords as great as they were, charging into the green horde. I expected them to be swallowed up, to be engulfed by the tide of the enemy. But to my surprise, the orcs were halted, as if the green wave had met a rock wall. The claymores of the Highlanders ripped heads from shoulders and removed the waste of dozens upon dozens of the enemy. With bellows of rage and black blood sprang like geysers, the Highlanders brought a vengeance upon the green demons like I'd never beheld in my life. But the raiders, they too were taking their merit. As a few orcs attempted to rally, I saw axes bury into the skulls of giant beasts and wrench them back to the ground. To the shock of not only myself, but Tomaway and William as well, Valkenheim had halted the green menace in its tracks. But I knew this would not last. We all knew. If nothing else, the orcs are persistent. It was not long before our forces were being f- forced backwards foot by foot. Highlanders were being cut down in spades, and several raiders suffered the splintering of their own axes before being hacked down themselves. A new presence appeared at my shoulder. It was not William, but Rodin, the conqueror, who he had come to know so well. William was already gone, leading his soldiers on his flanking maneuver, and would leave Rodin in charge of the Asheville forces. 
Rodan waited only a moment before he held out his flail to the line. "'Send these foul creatures to the abyss!' he roared. The catapults launched again, and with the horn bellowed, the surviving Highlanders and raiders pulled back immediately and fled. The orcs, so caught up in the battle, didn't even realize that the raining rock was aimed directly at where the Vikings had been moments ago. I cannot deny a grim sense of satisfaction, watching the flaming rocks crush hundreds of greenskins in short order, while the warlords of my people, shield ready and swords in hand, join the fray, leaping around the rocks to finish the injured and angry orcs. The rest of my Vikings were waiting for the chance to fight, but they would wait. It was not their time yet. Our trap was not yet sprung. The rocks that had been launched were covered in tar and pitch, and had been lit ablaze. The rolling projectiles had lit the ground with fire, and orcs were being swallowed up in it. The fire wouldn't last long, so while my warlords and berserkers mopped up the few that had escaped injury, I had to wait and see if Tobaway could uphold her end of things. I turned to look at her, but she was already raising a fan into the air with the red symbol of the sun on it. All along the slope, samurai archers were raising their bows and drawing back. "'Karate!' she screamed. Arrows like rain poured from the sky and struck down hundreds of beasts, howling and wailing in agony as they were pinned to the ashen and burning earth. "'Again!' she screamed. Archers notched their bows and began again, firing once more. And even as we made this progress, even as we managed to push back the tide of the enemy, the sea was still very large. We'd only taken a fraction of their forces, and the orcs were furious. The surge of green began pushing back, trampling over the fallen and injured to get at us. We could no longer rely on these tactics to slow them. The time had come. We would have to charge and meet them. Realign the catapults, Rodin bellowed. Focus on their center line. Take the enemy in the center mass. I took a moment to appreciate the wisdom in Rodin's orders. The catapults could continue firing down on the enemy, but not endanger us in the midst of fighting. I was proud of him. Proud to fight beside him. The few lines about her feelings towards Conqueror Road and omitted. Cute, though, it was to read. Tell me something, Tomoe, I said to Tomoe, who was now visibly sweating, either from the heat of the excitement or the battle itself. What do your people believe happens when one dies in battle? When we die, our spirits return to the great void, and then one day we'll be reincarnated into this world. What we reincarnate as depends on our actions in this life. These warriors today who die, I pray, will all reincarnate as samurai and be even greater. She smirked at me, though. When I was a child, we joked that for one to reincarnate as a Viking, they must have been very stupid in their previous life. I bristled a little, only for her to reach out and place her hand on my shoulder. I am pleased to have been wrong, my friend. Yours are an honorable people, and if your Valhalla is real, I pray to see you there. And I shall raise a toast in your honor, I agreed. You ladies aren't dead yet, Rodin growled, marching towards us. We've a battle to win. Count your dead when the battle is done. With his words of encouragement, all three of us gave the order to attack, and our tide of warriors ran forward to meet the enemy. From here, Ayala does not go into much detail as to what transpired during the battle. However, Daimyo Tomoe does give a rather impressive description of events, so I shall allow her account to be shared here briefly. It was my pride to see the forces of Amaku standing beside other samurai as we charged the orc menace, the pikemen in the front slowing the enemy rush as the Shugoki guard charged forward to begin smashing their way through the line. I charged the carnage myself my odachi singing as it sliced through thick hide and green flesh. Orochi shot past me, as if in a whirlwind of their own making, and where they ran, orcs fell. Every now and then, I thought I caught sight of Nobushi warriors or shinobi assassins cutting down orcs who had been caught unawares, but I had little time to focus on anyone other than myself. One massive brute with an underbite large enough to bite through my arm roared at me. I shoved my odachi up and into its maw, snapping its mouth shut. But I, myself, was caught blindsided as another orc barreled down towards me. It never touched me, though, as the moment it raised its axe to cleave me in two, its left arm was hacked off by an Aramusha who had seen the beast coming. 
I would have given my thanks, but the Aramucha was already battling yet another of the monsters. There was no time to catch my breath, no time to rest and try to take stock of the situation. The formation we had attempted to maintain couldn't hold, and the mad brawl had broken out innocently. But I am pleased to say we samurai were holding our own. We would fight, and we would die for honor and for glory. But even as I cut down my eighth or ninth foe, I could see things were starting to turn against us. An orc grabbed a Shugoki by the head and slammed him to the earth, stomping on him. I watched a shinobi attempt to kick an orc's head to disorient it, only for the beast to literally bite the poor fool's leg off like it was a cracker. And I saw Orochi fall as their bodies were ripped to pieces by the savage ferocity of the greenskins. Some of the orcs were laughing, basking in the carnage. I saw them approaching, looming over my men and I like a great shadow. But to my relief, their laughing was short-lived, for another force was now joining the battle. Al mortem! The orc nearest me felt his face hack in half as a poleaxe cut through its maw like it was slicing through butter. The lawbringer removed his poleaxe, and with a backhanded strike sent the corpse rolling. The knights of Ashfeld had joined the bloodbath, and they were more than well dressed for the occasion. Titans of gleaming metal stormed into the green tide, wading through bodies and brushing off crippling blows. I was again reminded why it is dangerous to anger Ashfeld, and why the Emperor had created the non-aggression pact in the first place. It is not impossible to slay a knight, but you will not walk away without paying a heavy price. And the knights demonstrated this truth. The Black Priors were a nightmare among the monsters, chanting a haunting hymn of damnation as they sliced through the enemy's ranks, and beside them ran the peacekeepers of the small and nimble woman order. Hidden behind cowls and hoods, they danced through the orc lines, slicing off limbs, legs, and heads as though born with blades on their fingers. Like our own shinobi, they faded in and out of sight like ghosts. And then I heard the horn and the call of the centurions began their march. Rally, men! one shouted. Close your formation and punch through the front line! Open a way for the injured to fall back! Don't give them an inch! Don't give a single step! You will hold this line or die doing it! It was at William's suggestion during our planning. There was no question we would suffer casualties, and many of them. If our soldiers became too injured with no way to retreat and regroup, morale would crumble. So it was at his suggestion that the knights wait a while to enter the fighting and push back the enemy, creating a path of retreat for the heavily injured who could assist the archers and catapult engineers. It would lessen our forces. But if any of our ranks could withstand the punishment of the orcs long enough to buy time, the knights could do it. And with a will did they. I saw conquerors tank blows that would have broken my own back. I beheld a gladiator hold off two orcs with only her trident. To think that the Iron Legion themselves had not shown up to the fight, and yet the few legions that had come were capable of this? The sight breathed new life into our soldiers, and the Vikings as well. I turned and waved my hand to the rear guard who sounded the counterattack horn. With a roar we plunged ourselves back into the fight, and the blood fell like rain. The morning sky was painted red with the reflection of magma and fury. Samurai, Viking, Knight... It mattered not for whom you fought, or from where you came. Every warrior on that field was one. Spears crashed into shields, axes hacked through bones, and swords removed life and limb of all they touched. Howls of rage were our battle hymn, and cries of pain were our benediction. Gods, demons, angels, heaven and hell. What did any of these things matter? This was war. This was something we knew, and nothing else came close. And for a moment, the briefest of moments, my thoughts turned to her. Apollyon, the saint of war herself, who had professed so many years ago that doctrine of war, that war was our primal goal and our only purpose. I'd thought her a fool, a war-craving beast. And yet, now as my sword met the enemy, and our blood drenched the earth, as sweat trickled down my face and my breasts, and my armor's weight felt like a welcome palm upon my back urging me forward, I saw the meaning of her creed. This was something I knew, something we all knew. It was an understanding that crossed our cultures, crossed our languages and beliefs. 
Our movements were as one. Our passion was a solitary bellow, and our cause all is the same. Before us lay a foe, and beside us stood allies. War, Krieg, Sinso, battle, whatever you wanted to call it, it meant the same thing to every one of us. And I smiled. An orc broke from the fray to charge me. I parried its wild strike, and then sidestepped, hacking open its midsection. And as blood and viscera poured out, I took glee in impaling it through the back of its head with my sword. I was not alone in this newfound purpose. All around me, even as they fell and died, I saw smiles on the faces of my allies and foes alike. It was what we all longed for. For too long our enemy had waited in the shadows, hiding from us, only coming out to engage in occasional skirmishes. And now here they stood, and we would fight them only as we knew how. And I thought back, even as I write these words, remembering something William had told me after his own encounter with the orcs at Hraffenfell. He said that in time we might be grateful to the orcs, for they have helped us tear down the boundaries between us. We may yet come to understand each other, come to care about one another, come to fight beside one another instead of against one another. A fool William most certainly was a hopeful and optimistic fool. But he was a fool I admire greatly, and as I stand blood on my sword, I fight beside Vikings and knights as if they were my own kin. I defend this volcano as if it were the Imperial Palace. I scream the battle cries of Valkenheim and Ashfeld. As warriors fall, my rage goes out to them, whether they be of samurai or not. We are not enemies or temporary allies here. We are all humans, brothers and sisters in arms, and all of us shared one common interest, the death of the green monsters destroying our home. As a note of interest, I shared this with a few contacts of mine in the Black Templar Astartes chapter. A few gave very solemn amens to this speech, something I felt I should share. However, as I was managing to catch my breath and my mind began to take in the war, a haunting truth began to set in. We had no chance of winning this. Regardless of how it appeared on the field of battle, the size of the York army was still quite massive, and we simply didn't have the numbers to deal with all of them. We needed more warriors. If only the Iron Legion were here, or perhaps if Horkos or Chimera could put aside their feud and just arrive in earnest. But no notification had come from either party. Worse yet, I was still reminded again of the orc reinforcements coming from the west to attack us from the side. The sisters of Lupin and some of my own warriors were there to intercept them, but would they hold out, or would we meet another deadly force on our flank? And then there was William himself. He was now off to kill the war chief in single combat. He'd fought one of their leaders before. He had a better chance than most to emerge victorious, but could he? And even if he won, would it be enough to turn the tide? Or would another rise and take his place as quickly as the first fell? Before I could contemplate further, I heard the cry of a warlord being gutted and ran to cover a gap in our line, fighting once more with all the fury in my heart. The only thought left in my mind was simple but true. If this is to be my final battle, I will die for not just the mire, but for Heathmore. And indeed it will be a glorious death.